I'm feeling very daunted um, because I came after Bradford and when Imperial wants to grow up, it wants to be Bradford. So I'm slightly <laughs> embarrassed about standing up in front of you in terms of dementia. So please excuse me. Um, my name's Jo and I'm the lead nurse for dementia at Imperial, um, Imperial College Healthcare NHS mm -hmm. Trust. Um, which is one of these monster, um, uncomfortable marriage of loads of different hospitals, trusts. Come a long way from home, so I can say that. Um, but um, we're, we're three very big acute hospitals, plus um, two slightly smaller hospitals, which all, all got married together a few years ago. Um, and so we have, we have a, you know, our sort of dementia patch as such as the three big acutes. And within that, we have, we have a very, very big renal unit. We have, I think, the biggest renal unit in Europe, which has about nine satellites. Um, we have a major trauma centre, hyperacute stroke centre, and all those sort of things as well. So there's, there's a sort of awful, awful lot going on. Um, and what I thought I'd do today was actually just talk a little bit about, about the different ways in which we've utilised the DRTS and sort of things we've tried out. Um, because I, I kind of looked at the list and I knew that there are people a lot further down the line with some of the stuff like the, the one to one -ing. So I thought, thought I'd talk a little bit about some of our other things that we're doing. So we um, have been, well actually I've been working with Graham for quite a long time. I can't remember when we first... Yeah, let's not mention that. Um, but, um, but we've been working at Imperial with, with Graham since and, and the team since about um, last year when I started. And we're very, very poor, so we torture um, Paul Graham and his team constantly by trying to scrounge freebies and stuff yeah. off them, which is shameless. And, um, and in fact, when, by, by the time we actually managed to get some money, which we actually got from M&S, because no one would give us any, um, uh, the, the, the trust didn't pay for a year, so it was really embarrassing. So they, they, you know, we bought them, we were so proud of buying them, and then you didn't get paid, did you? So, so we're, we're appalling, it's absolutely shameless. But, um, but you know that is one of the issues for us we have absolutely no money and, and people just laugh when you say look this will be a really good thing to have um, and so so it's a bit of a challenge but where we we've got four large units and six tablets and i'm not going to say how many actually belong to us out of that um, and we're using them a lot in acute admissions um, we're using them in acute medicine and stroke and obviously in medicine for the elderly we're actually doing a lot of work with our haemodialysis unit and I'm going to talk about that because that's actually a really sort of interesting area around dementia care, which I was a little surprised, I have to say, but, um, but, but we'll go there in a minute. And we're using it quite a lot post-operatively um, as well, and, and particularly in our, our trauma unit, our orthopedic unit. And I was laughing at the Elvis story because um, we, we, were, we were again torturing one of our, our consultant orthopedic surgeons with loud Elvis. On the, on the My Life unit um, a, a few weeks ago with a lady who would only listen to Elvis and was yelling along with it really happily. And he was going, will someone turn that off? And we're like, no. Um, so, so yeah, we've been having a beautiful Elvis experience recently. So the ways in which we use the units, so obviously we use them individually. And, and one of the things we found at the moment actually is, is you know, when people are in side rooms, they're so isolated. And, and people, unless they're being one to, you know, having one-to-one -one care, they're just left for long periods of time with nothing to do. I have a, I have a, a neurotic hatred of patient line um, for older people because I think it's really hard for them to manage it, you know, the old thing with a very small screen and lots of buttons. Um, and our patients just never, never use them. They never seem to work out how to use them, even if they, you know, even if they put money into them. Um, and so we use them a lot for people inside rooms, just, you know, just to, to sort of break up the day. We use them a lot in groups, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the groups that, that we particularly do. And we found a huge amount of success with delirious patients. And, and now, probably more than ever, you know, when somebody's delirious, we're getting phoned up and saying, you know, oh, God, have you got a My Life software unit you know, we can use? Sorry about the name, I keep saying it as well. It's the RTS unit. <laughs> um, and we use it in hemodialysis, as I said. And the other thing that we're working with the company on at the moment is developing teaching materials for it and things that actually can be a resource for other people because, you know, it's their staff are using it anyway. So it's a great opportunity just to add some things on which might actually make it easier to, to deliver different types of care. Um, and I'll show you a couple of the things that we've been doing with the company. So, social events. We are having a big campaign. Um, there's probably so many things wrong with this picture, I don't even want to begin, but it was Christmas, so that's, that's my excuse. 
Um, but we've been doing a lot of work around actually social eating events in our acute medicine for the elderly wards because our patients aren't eating. Staff often find it quite hard to engage with, with patients around, around refusing to eat and things like that. <coughs> so we've started doing sort of social eating events and we go up, we set up our table and we bring food and we use the um, DRTS unit as, as a sort of instant, you know, bring along party. Um, and, and as long as all the patients in the bay are happy about it, and we do always ask, I promise. Um, we'll sit everybody down and we'll do quizzes and we'll talk and we'll listen to music and we'll do a bit of karaoke. And they've been absolutely brilliant. They've actually really, you know, had an extraordinary effect. And, and now our social eating events have actually sort of, they're, they're spreading and we've got the stroke unit doing their own because they've realised people speak when they're sat around a table and you give them a pot of tea, some cake they'll actually start speaking to each other and so the speech and language therapists are actually running their own social eating events to get people talking. Um, and we found the, the software unit's been absolutely invaluable in that because it's got loads of sort of things that you can do. So loads of things you can actually quite easily get people engaged with. We always do the quiz and everybody always sits there and argues with the answers and they're reading them off the screen and um, obviously play music but also things like, you know, doing the karaoke. We, we actually, in one of, in one of our hospitals, we've discovered the matron's a really, really good singer and she actually just really loves it. And, and she's dragged in all these other, when she knows there's a tea party, she's, um, you know, she's dragged in all these other people. So there's now a junior doctor and there's a porter and she'll ring them up and she'll say, it's here, we've got to do it this afternoon. And they'll all be like, you know, you can't shut them up. The patients are just like, God, when they're going to stop. Um, but it's actually lovely because, you know, it's a completely different way of seeing your matron when she's standing there singing ABBA songs to you and this sort of thing. So, so it's worked really well. This is actually where the Abbasid singing goes on. This is at Hammersmith Hospital, and the reason I wanted to show this picture was because where we do the, tea, the social eating events there is actually in sort of a reception area, which is quite public. Um, it's just literally sort of by the entrance of the wards. And what we found, which is really interesting, is that other people just really want to get involved. So it ends up being a bit of a free-for-all. And these two boys um, actually were visiting their granny, and the granny was there. And they, we said, oh, no, you know, if, you know, go back to the ward, we'll take her back to the ward, it's no problem. And they were like, no, no, I want to stay. And, of course, what they were attracted by was the sort of tech. And, and they were really excited about having a fiddle with this sort of, with the screen. And they got very possessive, as, as teenage boys do. Um, so I've got sons, so I know that. Um, and, and they ended up spending, you know, actually spending probably two hours being the compares of this whole sort of party. And patients loved it because obviously it was all really intergenerational and, and the patients actually just were having such a laugh with these lads doing quizzes and all this sort of thing. Um, and that is something we found actually has been really, really good is that being able to engage younger people because it's something quite attractive to younger people to, to be fiddling with a computer. And because lots of our healthcare assistants and people like that are actually quite a lot younger often and you know, they're quite often you get school leavers and sort of quite young people doing it. It's a really, really useful thing to get them sort of in, you know, interested in doing that kind of that interaction with patients. So it works really well. And that's just everybody really concentrating on a quiz and asking questions, because there was a big discussion, no one agreed with the answers. Some of the answers are a little bit dodgy. Oh, okay. yeah, we, we, <laughs> there's a lot of disagreement. Um, so that's one way we've been using it, and we use that quite regularly. Another way is, is, is with delirious patients. And I wanted to tell you about Johnny. Johnny um, was a bit of a challenge. He jumped out of a window and broke both his ankles, um, not because he was feeling suicidal, just because he wanted to leave, apparently. Um, and he decided that was the quickest way. That's what he said afterwards. Um, but he developed very severe delirium when he was in hospital. And um, he became really extremely aggressive. And he was very, very noisy, very shouty. He had a very, very limited attention span. And the problem with him was if you tried to sort of engage with him, if you talked to him, he just got angrier and he got more and more furious with you. Um, and we were referred him because, you know, the staff just didn't really know what to do. And he kept trying to get out of bed and he had these broken ankles and it was all a bit of a disaster. And we tried loads of things. We found out loads about him and we talked to his family and we tried, you know, we, we tried sort of, you know, his favourite football team, he was very into football. Um, and we got loads of information about that and we sort of tried all these different things and to be honest we were actually, we thought about using the DRTS unit and we were actually a bit worried about it because we thought he might break it. 
um, um, because he was, he was really, really very aggressive. He was throwing a lot of things. Um, but when we ran out of ideas, we thought we really ought to sort of see what we can do. And we did actually find out he'd lived in Ireland as a child. And then from that conversation from his wife, we actually found out he used to play in an Irish band. So we thought, mm, try some traditional Irish music and see what happens. And it was literally like turning a switch on. And we, you know, we'd put this music on and he, he would just stop shouting. And he'd start engaging with you and he'd start talking. And, and it was absolutely extraordinary. While the music was on, he, he would let you, you know, he would let, he would let people do personal care. He would talk to them, he would eat, he would drink. The moment you turn the music off, the shouting would start again. It, it was really extraordinary. But what was also extraordinary, so he calmed down and we were able to do all these things. And he could actually understand questions when he had the music on. But what was really interesting about it was we then, because we only had one unit in, in this hospital, we wanted to use it for somebody else. So we thought, well, it's only listening to music. So we, we thought we'd sneak in a CD player with some, some traditional Irish CDs. Um, and we put it on and his behavior escalated again. And in fact, what he was doing was he was watching the screen and it was the movement on the screen with the music. It's almost like a visual inter you know, representation of the music was actually what was holding his attention and that's, you know, he had to have the visual thing as well as the music for it to work and the moment we took the visual thing away it didn't work anymore. So he had it for like a month and his wife wanted to take it home but we said they couldn't obviously. But it was amazing, it worked incredibly well and so it's not, you know, when you were saying about them saying, you know, why well, are we spending all this money on a sort of effectively a CD player? It, yeah, the visual thing is a really massive thing as well, that being able to watch the music. So he felt calm when he could see the turntable. So I want to talk about our hemodialysis unit. Um, and this is a, a dialysis unit that's actually based, basically designed to take people that people are struggling to dialyse in the community. So people with really complex renal problems. And of course all the confused patients because the, the, the regional units find it really hard to manage them. I didn't know there was anybody with dementia particularly having dialysis around the place. It was all a bit of a surprise to me when I discovered this, but three times a week, 17 out of their 23 patients have, have dementia. Um, and so it's actually a really high number of their patients have dementia. And the challenges are really unique. They're, they're, they're very, very sort of concerned and obsessed and, and very obsessional about, you know, infection control, rightly. Um, they have very unstable patients. And when we asked them how many emergencies they had, they said every single day, they will have a significant emergency because they're dialyzing the really unstable patients. So they have to have, you know, if you do anything, it has to be able to be moved out of the way very quickly because somebody somewhere is going to go off on the unit. They also have quite a lot of younger people. And at the moment they have, um, there's four patients with learning disabilities and dementia at the moment that, that we know about. And <coughs> obviously for younger people with dementia, it's, it's, you know, it's very different. And all of them are under 40. And the youngest one is now 24. Uh, patients are frequently visually impaired as well as, as having dementia, which is a problem as well. And the staff are absolutely desperate for a solution. And we were called because they just they were desperate to, to find some way of managing this very large group of patients who clearly don't want to be dialysed. You know, they're all trying to pull out the lines and they're trying to get off the chair. Yeah, they, they actually have beds. And they're faced with nurses dressed like this because that's how they have to put, you know, that's what they have to do when they, you know, when they're changing their lines and stuff. Um, and that in itself is really frightening for someone with dementia. And so there are lots and lots of challenges. So we introduced um, the software units, actually it was last year, wasn't it? Um, still haven't bought um, these ones. But um, we introduced them just to see if there was any chance that it would make a difference, if there was anything, you know, and, and they were quite, they were kind of, oh, we're too busy, we're not going to be able to do this. They were kind of iffy, but they liked it, again, because it was technical, and they're very technical nurses. They're all kind of into, you know, machines that go beat. So getting them a machine that, that did something else was sort of quite exciting to them, so they quite liked that. And they all learned how to use it really, really quickly. You know, you know, on some wards, you really have a challenge with people switching it off the whole time. And on, um, on, this, you know, on this particular unit, they all, they all knew how to use it within a week. They were, like, spot on, so it was quite funny. And what we found was they liked the tech, but we, we had our 24-year-old with dementia, Salim, who'd been a real problem and was one of the reasons we thought of it in the first place. Actually, um, it had been impossible to dialyse. The moment he was put on the machine, he'd be saying, I want to get off it, I want to get off it, and he'd be pulling at things and, and struggling. And they were, you know, they were despairing over what to do about it. 
And he actually uses a tablet. And he basically, the idea was we said, you know, give him a go with this and, you know, see if he likes it. And then, you know, you can see if you can use it. It's now become known as Salim's machine. And he has it every single time he comes in, which is three times a week. And it's charged up for him. And he goes through the entire catalogue of stuff every time because he knows it now. He recognises it because he's been doing it for a year. And he literally, he'll start at the beginning and he'll work his way through everything. It takes him about sort of two and a half, three hours to get through everything. Um, and by that time, he's had quite a substantial amount of his dialysis before he starts getting bored and wanting to go. And, and it's been an enormous success and unexpected because he's so young and we thought maybe he wouldn't be that interested in, in what's on it. But actually loves it. He just loves the fact that he can use it and he can use it independently and he can just sit there doing it. Um, and it's worked really brilliantly for him. So patients as well, the other patients like the activities and they're slowly starting to incorporate it into, into you know, staff are slowly starting to see the value of it and are incorporating it into the care. They're much more aware now of the need to sort of entertain patients and to, and to have activities. Um, and we also did, we did um, a burnout sort of study on them, um, the Maslach Burnouts Inventory. And um, we're seeing a reduction. They were very, you know, it was very, very high when we first did it. And we've, we've done it again recently and it's dropped down a little bit. It's not a, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a woolly tool, but it was just something to see if, if the staff felt things were improving. Um, and, and we're seeing it reduce. And I think as we go on using it, we'll see it reduce more. And we, we think it works really well in renal. Um, and so that's somewhere we need to, you know, we need to explore getting more of them, hopefully. So the teaching tool. Um, we've recently um, written the Eastwood Guide to Dementia Care in Hospital, which will be going on it. Um, and we've also done an instructional film, uh, which I'll show you a bit of, which is, is, you know, you can actually, staff can just copy doing a hand massage. So you, you, know, you can turn the volume down and they can just copy it so they can feel confident to do it. Um, and the reason for that is because we use a huge amount of hand massage in, in our trust. We really encourage nurses to learn how to do it just so that even when you're talking to someone, people are just rubbing hands and they use, you know, they put oil on their hands and just, it's a really nice feeling for patients. We've actually got one HCA now who gives foot mass massages to all the patients before they go to sleep on her ward, which is fantastic. And they're very quiet on her nights. So the subjects covered in the guide are the, the range of subjects you'd expect to be in talking about, but all, all with relation to hospitals. Um, and the key, you know, the, the sort of, thing about it is just exploring you know what is feasible to do in hospital and what isn't and um, we've got a big section on activities and things that we found have worked and I mean obviously it's, it's you know it's in our experience um, what, we've, what we think has worked and hasn't worked and they're all sort of standard format and we have a body of information and then with most of them we do a little section on what to consider when doing activities and the idea is again if you've got somebody fairly junior who just thinks oh God, they've told me I've got to entertain this patient and this patient's glaring at them on the other side of the bed. It gives them something to sort of help them along and think about it and think, actually, maybe we shouldn't be doing that with this patient. Maybe we should try this. So it gives them a few, you know, tips on what to do. And there's references because everybody loves a reference. So here's an example of the, the activity sections at the end of the chapters. And this, you know, basically we've divided them up into sort of physical, sort of passive relaxation stuff, cognitive activity, reminiscence and group and social. And this obviously is the one for the delirious patients. And you know, just making the point that if you've got, for example, a, somebody with a hypoactive delirium, you might really not want to be massaging them because they're going to go to sleep and then you don't want to be able to wake them up properly. Um, or you might not want to, you know, do, do the more sort of, you know, tranquil things. You might be wanting to do something which perks them up a bit. And vice versa for your hyperactive patients, you might be, you know, thinking maybe we won't do loud music and karaoke singing today because it might just wind them up a little bit more. So there's lots of very sort of simple sort of bits of advice which, which just, you know, hopefully will be helpful to people um, and, and changes the use of it to be becoming more of a sort of education tool as well and something the staff can utilise as well. Other than just playing the games, which are really cool and I really like the shooting one. But I shouldn't say that, should I? So I'm going to show you a little bit of the video and then I will be finished, I promise. Um, I'm going to make you do this. And this is with Jules, who's my, um, one of my dementia CNSs, and she very nobly put on a uniform to do this, so she looked like a nurse. She's an RMN, so she doesn't normally wear one. 
And um, it's with Patricia, who's a lady, a peer support worker, who has dementia. One of the things you might want to try is you can use your knuckles in here, which sounds a bit scary. But if you make your hands into a fist, and you can then roll your knuckles a bit like this. It takes a little bit of practice to do that. But you can actually practice on yourself if you want to learn. And it's literally moving round the palm of the hand with your knuckles. And you can learn to do that on yourself. And then you can try it on a person with dementia. So we're going to try that on you, Patricia. And again, obviously, if anything hurts, let me know. But I've got her hand secured with mine. So it's nice and stable and feels secure. Yes. My thumb's over your wrist, actually, so that it stays extra stable. And we're going to try that movement in the palm of the hand. So we just wiggle our fingers round. Now, Patricia's got a little bit of stiffness here in her thumb. Yes. So we're not going to push that too hard. I've got arthritis in that thumb. Yeah. So we're just going to dig around the looser area because this doesn't move, does it? No. So we'll dig around here and hopefully that feels quite pleasant. It does. <laughs> we hold lots of stress in here, lots of stress. Um, so if you are able to massage this area, it can often feel very, very relaxing, very comforting. And actually, it's really nice then to just hold someone's hand for a little bit. Yes. And it does feel nice. The heat of the hand is it's it's quite something, isn't it? Yes. When you've massaged, it feels very warm. Yes, it does. So we can come down the hand and then we can turn it back over. And all the time I'm keeping in contact with Patricia as much as possible so that you feel secure. And I'm going to work my way up your arm slightly. So I'm going to move you a little bit forward. That's it. And we're going to massage from the wrist to the elbow. And again, if anything's painful, let me know, but it shouldn't be. This area here is quite soft. And the elbow here, where we're going to massage around, is an area we tend to neglect. Yes. We can forget about putting moisture on there. Sometimes it gets a little bit dry, so it's always there nice are. to do. I won't, I won't ruin the excitement of seeing the whole thing. <laughs> In summary, I think, you know, one of the things we've found is that DRTS is really cross-generational, and that's actually really useful and useful thing to remember. Numerous ways we can apply it, which we didn't think of initially. And watching the turntable can be as effective as an activity. That, in an, you know, the, the presence of it and being near somebody can work as an activity. And our biggest impacts have been calming people down and also engaging the unengageable, people who we really, you know, really struggled to, to get through to. Sometimes it's worked really well on that particular patient group. And it even has a place in really hyper-acute um, units. And our next stop is, is major trauma, which we've got a major trauma unit. Um, and they, they, they've kind of shown sort of, again, it's machinery and they love machinery. So hopefully that will kind of get us in there. Um, but that's our next, our next step. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you.